Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I hope everybody is starting out this year well. I hope each of you have an expectation for a good year. I am trusting this is going to be a good year. As this year begins, the thing that is on my mind is love. Pause. God is love. Greater no greater command is that there is no greater command than this to love God with all of your heart, soul, <coughs> mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. This is what it's all about. People who study these things essentially say when it all comes down to it, the quality of our lives is dependent on the quality of our relationships. That's what it's about. It ain't about money, Amen. although we need money, at least a little bit of it. <coughs> it ain't about power. It ain't about pleasure, although we need power to do the work that God has given us to do. And God does give us many things to enjoy. And he pours out these blessings on us abundantly. And yet, we are to find our ultimate joy in God and in relationships with others. <coughs> and I often ask myself the question, how much does my life demonstrate that I love God? And how much does my life demonstrate that I love others? We are told to live a life of love just as Christ loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice to God. Jesus is our ultimate example of love. Greater, no, greater love has no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friend. And we can learn from Jesus what it means to love God and love others. And we have been privileged to be going through the Gospels. And the Gospels... Tell about Jesus. <clears throat> and we get to see Jesus in action. <clears throat> At the beginning of the Gospel of John, which we have been studying, it's been a, it's been a while, it's been a few weeks mm -hmm. yeah. since I've preached through John. We've had some wonderful uh, speakers the last several weeks, and we... We had a snow day last time, but we're, we're now getting back into the Gospel of John. And in the very first chapter of John, in the prologue, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father. Can you finish this next phrase? Full of grace, grace and, truth. and truth. Full of grace and truth. I don't know about you, but I'm glad when people show grace <coughs> to me. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad when people tell me the truth. Yes. 
And in Jesus, we see somebody who is full of both grace and truth. Now, some of us, I think, may be more of grace-type people. We just like to accept people. We don't like to judge people, blah, blah, blah. You know, we, we, we just like to be kind and loving and caring and accepting. Or at least that's our default tendency. We just like to love on people. Let's just all get along together. Some of us maybe are more truth tellers, naturally. We just tell it like it is. It's like, yeah, well, you know, we don't want to get, we don't want them to get off track there. And, you know, the world will just go the wrong way if we don't tell the truth. Well, we need both. We need both truth and grace. <clears throat> Jesus had an encounter with a woman at a well in the town of Sychar in the region of Samaria. You remember that? We did that about a month ago. We, we covered about the first half. Jesus had surprised her by talking to her. There she was coming to fetch her water in the heat of the day. Typically, people would come either in the morning or at night to fetch water. And if she were coming then, we can only imagine why. Why would she be coming at the heat of the day? Was it because she didn't want to face the townspeople? In her encounter with Jesus, we find out that she has been married five times <laughs> and is living with a man who is not her husband. In Jesus' encounter with her, first, she sees him as a Jewish man and is surprised that he's talking to her. Then, when he tells her her life story without her having told him, she says, I see you are a prophet. And... When Jesus says, if you had asked him who is speaking to you, he would have given you living water. And Jesus, or and the, the woman replied, Sir, give me this water so that I don't have to come, come here to fetch water. And he revealed to her that this is a different kind of water. This is a water that wells up into eternal life. And the woman is now saying, wow, this man is more than a prophet. He's not just a man. He's not just a prophet. We come down to verse 21. In answer to some of the woman's questions about worship. Okay, yeah, all right, sorry. Verse 19 was said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mount, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is of the Jews. But an hour is coming, and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. 
more than a man, more than a prophet, the Messiah speaking to a woman in an obscure village in the heat of the day. And I love transitions. I won't jump up and down, <laughs> but it's kind of like, meanwhile, back at the ranch, <laughs> all of this was happening. Now what's going to happen? It's like, ooh, ooh, tell me, tell me. Well, it says, just then, verse 27, just then, his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? <clears throat> so the woman left her jar, left her water jar, and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. This interaction with Jesus had a deep impression on the woman. She had come to draw water. She needed water to live. But she left her water pot at the well. And suddenly her trip had a new meaning. It wasn't just to go fetch water. It was about to tell her family and friends or whoever was living in town, I just met a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they started streaming out of town to come visit Jesus. An aspect of all loving, caring relationships is trust. Mm -hmm. There has to be acceptance. There has to be a sense in which you can tell the truth and be told the truth. Here the woman had a sense that Jesus knew her inside and out and was still talking to her and was not condemning her. And she must have felt that, wow, this, this man is unique, to say the least. I just wonder what she must have been feeling at that time. I mean, could this be the, the hope of, the, of all the ages right here? Now, it's so interesting through the Gospels how the Gospels are not afraid to share with us that the people that Jesus interacted with didn't get it. <laughs> Thick-headed, hard-headed, thick-skulled, hard whatever. They didn't get it over and over and over again. And it, we, thank goodness I'm not the only slow learner. Yeah. I learned that there are other people that takes a while to get things. Well, meanwhile, the, Jesus, uh, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. I mean, they had gone into the food. They had gone to Chipotle or McDonald's <laughs> or Taco Bell, and they were bringing back the burrito. No, no, whatever. Um, <laughs> And so there they were, you know, get it while it's hot. No, I'm sorry, that, that was my own interpolation there. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, did, did he get carry out? Oh, no. <laughs> so the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Now, of course, he wasn't talking about physical food. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Okay, let, let's, let's back up a moment here. I, a few sentences ago, and a few attempts at a joke ago, I was talking about the importance of trust in relationships. And we go deeper in relationships as we are able to reveal more of ourselves and get to know more of the other. So to really get to know someone else takes time.
time. Mm -hmm. It takes experience. It takes getting to know them in various situations. And we need to know how they react under certain situations. How do they react under stress? How do they react with people who are from different backgrounds from they? How do they react in joyful situations? And not only has the woman learned something about Jesus by how he interacted with her, but the disciples are learning about Jesus, about how he is interacting with them. Jesus is modeling what it means to make disciples. He is asking them questions. He is making <coughs> observations. He is seizing teachable moments. And he is opening up their eyes to things beyond what they can see. Sometimes we can be looking right at something and be blind to it. Sometimes we might be right in the presence of something and have no knowledge of it. Be oblivious to it. And indeed, Jesus says the following. Do not say, there are yet four months, then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Now, Jesus says a whole lot here. There's, there's a whole Old Testament background to this. Uh, there's a lot to unpack here, and it's very rich and very deep. Suffice it to say that Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is here. Kingdom work is happening right before their very eyes. The kingdom of heaven is coming into this woman's life, into this town's life, into the disciples' life. The very Messiah <coughs> is revealing his glory in their midst. <coughs> now, while the disciples were having this conversation with Jesus, the people from the town were starting to stream out. And in verse 39, it says, Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked, him to stay with them. We just sang a song. Be with me, Lord. I cannot live without thee. Can you imagine what it would be like to have Jesus come to your house or to come to your town for two days? And he would teach and you could watch him and you could listen to him and you could... Did he do healings? Did he do... Uh, did he cast out demons? I don't know. It doesn't say the Gospels don't tell us. But what I imagine is he revealed himself to the people of the town. He taught them about the kingdom of God. He draw them, he drew them to him. So they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believed, for we have heard it for ourselves, and we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. Wow. To have the Savior of the world in your midst, and to receive the testimony that 
They have now found the Savior of the world. And meeting him was so exciting that the woman was willing to leave her pot and with excitement go tell the people in her town, come, meet a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? <laughs> she was excited. She had just met this man. And I just wonder how her life changed after that. <laughs> I wonder how her relational life changed. We don't know. But I trust it changed. I trust she changed. Maybe someday we'll meet her and we'll ask her. Well, I don't know. It would be interesting. There's so many different stories. And we're told at the very end, after two days, he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So the kingdom of heaven is starting to grow. Even as he told his disciples before he left that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So Jesus is preaching and proclaiming, first in Jerusalem, then in Judea, now in Samaria. And then he will be ministering in Galilee, and then um, he will send his disciples throughout the earth. Back to the beginning of my sermon in time to wrap up. I mentioned, I said, the theme that I've been thinking about much in recent time is love. And that we are to live lives of love. In an aspect of love, or to live a life of love, we must live as Jesus did, a life filled with grace and truth. To have, to be followers of Jesus is to speak words of life and truth. I think evangelism, and many people tense up when they start hearing that word evangelism. It's like, did you start feeling tense? Uh-oh, the preacher's starting to talk about evangelism. Not that again, please. All right, I want us to take a breath. Don't worry. And I, my goal for this year is that evangelism is no longer going to immediately cause us to have rigor mortis, <laughs> to kill us. But it's going, we are going to start looking at it more as matchmaking. That we have the privilege... It's not exactly, the analogy isn't perfect, but we have the privilege of introducing Jesus to others. Yeah. They get to see the man who is not just a man, not just a prophet. Mm -hmm. He's the Messiah, the Savior of the world. A man who will know everything that they have ever did and yet accept them and yet love them and yet not leave them there but to sanctify them and change them and bring them out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and if our lives are filled with love if people can trust us with their stories and people can trust us with their burdens then they will see Jesus in us and I hope that we, as Jesus told his disciples, look, the fields are ready for harvest. They're right here. It's your next door neighbor. It's your coworker. It's your family member. They are all looking for hope. They are looking for grace and truth. They may not know that they're looking for Jesus, but we have the privilege of telling other people about the man who has changed our lives. And we can say, and, and then maybe someday they will be able to say, we believe not just because you told us, but we have seen and heard for our very selves. And we believe that he is the savior of the world. Let's pray together. Father, we're slow to learn sometimes. 
We're hard-headed, hard-hearted. Mm -hmm. But we thank you, Lord, that you do not leave us as we are. And we pray that this year, that you will help us to change. Change with greater love in our hearts. That our hearts may be even more filled with grace and even more filled with truth. And that we will see the harvest. We will plant and labor as you send us out. And if it is our privilege to harvest those that others have labored for, please help us to be faithful laborers. We do pray that you will send workers because the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. And we pray, O oh God, that from our congregation that you will indeed raise up workers for your harvest field. Fill us with your joy, grace, and spirit. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So, you've heard the word. Jesus is filled with grace and truth. Wouldn't you not want to come to him? The body of Christ is filled with grace and truth. We will pray for you. Whatever your need may be, please make it known as we stand and sing the song of invitation.